Number three. Okay. Um, good evening to all our colleagues. Um, on behalf of Sada Limpopo branch, I would like to welcome everyone tonight's webinar on oral intercommunications presented by Dr. Stephen Mvala. Um, before we start, I'd like a few house rules that we need to go through. Um, point number one, please refrain from using the raised hand, but type your comments and questions on the Q&A tab. Uh, secondly, CPD certificates will be loaded on the SADA platform and you will be able to access all, your, access all your certificates under your member profile. If you are not a SADA member, you will be able to create a profile for yourself and access your CPD certificates. The event for tonight qualifies for one CPD point. Um, we are streaming live on YouTube also. So just in case you have difficulty accessing the Zoom platform, you can use the YouTube. Um, just one or, two, one or two other announcements. Um, the upcoming webinars, um, there will be one on the 15th and the 17th of June, uh, presented by uh, Henry Shine. The doctors will be Dr. Mark Bowes and Dr. Alistair McKelvey. And the topic is defensive dentistry. Does it really reduce your risk? And uh, injecting mold in restorative dentistry. Those two will be the one with Alice McKelvey will be on the 15th and the one by Dr. Mark Bowes will be on the 17th of June and that will be the injection molding in restorative dentistry. And um, Asada's virtual Congress exhibition on will be held on the 27th to the 29th of August, 2021. The theme will be um, Back to the Future, Excellence in Dentistry. Um, Dr. Mark Bowes, the Congress convener and his team are working hard on creating a program with at least 10 international speakers. So we urge members to diarize these dates and it's something for us to look forward to. Okay, um, now that we've gone through all the announcements, we can start with tonight's presentation. Um, oral enteral communications um, do not occur very frequently, but when they do happen, they they result in an anxious patient and a stressed out clinician. Over the years, as clinicians, we have dubious success with regards to the closure of oral enteral communications. Sometimes, sometimes managing to close them, and other times having them to re, having to refer them to our maxillofacial and oral surgeons down the road. Uh, the objective of tonight's webinar will be will be to provide us with guidelines that will assist us as general dentists to obtain more predictable outcomes when dealing with these complications. Um, tonight, we are privileged to have with us Dr. Stephen Mpala, 
Dr. Steven Mbala obtained his Bachelor of Dental Science degree from the University of Witwatersrand in 2012. He then did his community service at the National District Hospital in Bloemfontein in 2013. Between 2014 and 2017, he was permanently employed by the Free State Department of Health at the Frida Hospital. He later joined the maxillofacial unit at Pelanomi Tertiary Hospital in 2018, where his interest in this discipline developed. In September of the same year, he started his journey as a registrar in the maxillofacial and oral surgery department at the University of Witwatersrand. He is currently in his third year of registrarship and has completed his basic surgical skills, ATLS, and master class in orthognathic surgery. Um, welcome, Dr. Mvala. Over to you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Khan. Uh, good evening, colleagues. Uh, that, uh, it's an honor to be doing this talk. Uh, hopefully, it will be enjoyable mm -hmm. as, as, as much as I did enjoy when I was preparing it. So, uh, like Dr. Khan has said, uh, the topic will be on uh, closure and management of oral enteral communications. So we're just gonna get the ball going and rolling so that people don't have to look at my face for the whole night. So as per definition, oral enteral communications are defined as a natural space between the maxillary sinus and the oral cavity. And you find that males are more affected than females with a ratio of two to one uh, due to the higher frequency of uh, dramatic extractions in men. Uh, it is common in the fourth decade of life and it, it is mostly associated with the first and second molar extraction. Um, the most common uh, route that this can occur from is actually the nasal buccal root of the second molar, which is about uh, 0 0.83 millimeters from the apex of it is 0 0.83 millimeters from the sinus floor. The second most common uh, uh, root will be the palatal root of the first molar, which is about uh, uh, 1.56 millimeters from the sinus floor. An oral antral fistula is when you get um, uh, epithelialization between uh, of that OAC, and it usually occurs when an OAC persists uh, for longer than 72 hours. So when you get into the types of OAC, this is just a, a, a brief classification according to their location. You get alveolo sinusal ones, which are the most common. They follow, they normally follow uh, dental extractions. Vestibulo sinusal, uh, which occur on the vestibular side, like the name suggests. They follow carrier look procedures uh, and the cliff lip alveolus. And then you get the ones that occur on the palate. Uh, they're called the palatal sinusal OAC, they usually result from pathology or trauma, e.g. from the fourth fractures or after a maxillectomy. So with regards to the anatomy of the maxillary bone and the maxillary sinus, because those are structures that we are interested in. So the maxillary bone, form, it forms the upper jaw, uh, it is involved in the formation of the orbit, uh, the nose. It's pyramidal in shape. It has five processes. So it's got the body, which will then house the maxillary sinus, the frontal process, the zygomatic process, the palatine process, which we'll see as we go ahead with the presentation. That it's important in the management. Uh, some of the management options are actually from the palate and the alveola, which houses our, our teeth. So this is a slide just showing the um, blood supply and uh, innovation of the palate. As we can see, it's from the greater palatine and the lesser palatine uh, artery and the nerve supply 
from the greater and lesser palatine nerves. With regards to the maxillary sinus, it, it is the largest of the sinuses. Uh, it's got five folds, which are the anterior medial, which communicates with the lateral nasal wall, the superior, which is formed by the floor of the orbit, the posterior formed by the zygomatic and the spinal bone and the lateral. So it is lined uh, by uh, a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium called the Schneiderian membrane. So usually when you get infection of the, of the, of the sinus inflammation, uh, this is the, 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 the membrane which uh, is responsible for sinusitis. It has an ostium medially which uh, it communicates with the middle meatus with. So this is um, the radiographic classification of the roots to, to the sinus floor. Uh, it was made by Hasagawa and colleagues. So it usually, they use it to predict the chances or the likelihood of getting um, an OAC post uh, an extraction. So they divided it into type one to five. With your type one, that's where you get a clear distinction between the, the roots and the, the floor of the sinus. So as we can tell, the roots are pretty much far from the floor of the sinus. So when you look at an X-ray, take an X-ray and you look, you can see with this type one, you are actually safe. It's highly unlikely unless you fracture something very high up that you might end up with an OEC. Type two and type three, uh, that's where you get superimposition of uh, or overlap of the roots and the sinus floor. And then as we can all imagine that type two and type three would be um, associated with the higher risk of having an OAC after an extraction. So type four, uh, it's where the sinus floor, the, the sinus floor is in close, close proximity to the roots, but you can see a clear distinction between uh, the floor and the roots. So there's relative risk of getting an OAC post extraction. Usually when uh, the, the, the extraction was very traumatic, you might get up, get uh, an OAC. But if uh, the extraction was gentle, atraumatic, uh, you can possibly get away without an OAC. And then type five, um, it's where um, there's an indistinct relationship uh, of the floor uh, and the roots. As you can see from the diagram, there's um, discontinuity, what seems to be a discontinuity in the floor. So you can't really assess because you're looking at um, a 2D um, view on an X-ray of something which is actually 3D. So you can't really tell what, what, where is the floor in some areas. So the etiology of OACs um, is mostly caused by dental extractions. Uh, fracture of, of the tuberosity. This usually happens when you're extracting a long standing um, aid and then you use extreme force and then you just fracture the tuberosity. If then the tuberosity is in close uh, approximation to the sinus, you might get an OAC. Um, you also get them from pathological lesions whether those lesions um, originate from the maxilla or from the sinus, it can result in an OEC. Uh, also from implant dis dislodgement into the sinus. Also, although very rare, you can get them from uh, Lefort osteotomies or when you do your Caldwell loop procedure. Like I've said, um, the dental extractions are the most common. Um, the first and second molar extraction are mostly implicated. 
So this is due to the close proximity of the apices to, to the sinus. And then fracture of the tuberosity, like we can see on this uh, uh, image here, the fracture was there quite high, which then on the floor resulted in a, uh, a discontinuity of the flow and communication there. And then with the dislodgement of the implant, uh, that's where you get an implant in, in the sinus. Uh, so with regards to the signs and symptoms uh, of uh, OACs, you get uh, bubbling of blood in the socket. Uh, they can come with pain. Uh, there's altered nasal resonance. You get uh, unilateral, unilateral nasal regurgitation of liquids or nasal discharge. They also present with foul odor and taste. And then you can also get uh, sinusitis depending on how long the patient has had the, 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 the problem. Uh, what is also important is to know that, uh, and also to recognize that sometimes you might induce uh, an OAC and then the patient doesn't come back complaining. So you get those few patients that actually can be asymptomatic. With uh, the diagnosis of uh, OACs, firstly, you can get a pretty good idea from the history taking, especially if the patient went to an, uh, for an extraction from another practitioner and an OAC was missed, now they come to you. You would actually get from the history, the signs and symptoms. Uh, that will give you a pretty much uh, a good idea that you're dealing with an OEC. And then you go on to your intraoral examination where you can um, examine the site. If uh, the perforation is big enough or the defect is big enough, you can visual, visualize it. Uh, you can ask the patient to blow their cheeks. And then if there's an OEC, obviously the, 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 the the air will then escape through the OAC into the nose. Uh, you can put a mirror on, on, on the socket and then you actually, if there's an OAC, you will see fogging of, of that mouth mirror. Uh, you can ask the patient to do a Basalva test, which is just to ask uh, the patient to close their, their nose and gently expel air against that uh, closed nose with the mouth open. Um, so if there is an OAC, uh, air will pass through the, the communication or blood will, 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 will drop from that uh, communication that would indicate a positive uh, Basalva test. And then with your special investigations, you can take periapicals, penal penalips, CBCT, or if, even if you, you go fancy and you do a CT scan, but it just depends on what, what you have available. Uh, with regards to special investigation, it is always important to do an X-ray before you do any tooth extraction. I know we, 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 we all get taught that you can't do an extraction uh, without an X-ray, but uh, where we do our concepts and where we, we, we practice is not really possible, but it's, it, it is important that you, you do take an X-ray. Uh, especially for teeth that are, are mobile and there's no cross period that can maybe uh, explain the mobility of the tooth cause. Now you, you could be dealing with uh, periapical lesions or pathologies, so just, extracting the teeth and being happy that the tooth is out, uh, you might have left a bigger problem uh, under the periapical. So with uh, management of this uh, oral antral communications, uh, there are a few factors that uh, affect the actual management. 
the first one is the size of the defect, like we're gonna see shortly, um, the duration at diagnosis. So obviously you can treat um, an OEC that has just happened now, the same way as uh, a long-standing one, because now is presence of If there's infection, obviously you would uh, try to clear that infection before attempting to close. Um, you also look uh, the state of your available soft tissue. Um, obviously, if your soft tissue is compromised uh, and then there is other options you would, uh, where the, the soft tissue is much, much better and healthier, you would uh, opt for those options. Uh, you also have to think about uh, future placement of uh, implants. It's if maybe a patient wants to like maybe restore or maybe have implants placed, uh, you have to think about lifting that sinus so that you know there is actual space to put uh, um, an implant. An implant, and also with that, you have to also think about if there's not enough bone, uh, maybe crafting that site. So for preoperative management, so I put this slide just for the fact that if you induce an OAC and then you can't close it, how, how do we approach that, uh, that, that scenario? So we can actually put a patient on mouth rinses. Well, we should assume that they are using mouth rinses already, but uh, yeah, it's that they put them on mouth rinsing. Uh, you cover them with antibiotics because now you have this uh, communication where uh, oral bacteria are constantly going into the sinus because there's a path. And then you give them uh, nasal decongestant so that they don't blow their nose and then make the fistula or the, the communication bigger. And then strict instructions for them not to uh, blow their noses. So this is the, 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 the treatment protocol that was suggested in one of uh, the articles that I used for, 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 to prepare for the talk. So if um, uh, an OAC is two millimeters or less, uh, we treat it conservatively. So two millimeters, uh, it's not that big. So ideally we, we would uh, think that a blood clot will form and then it will spontaneously heal. If it's two to five millimeters, uh, you can actually, it's slightly bigger. A, a blood clot might not close it. So what you can do, you can take uh, maybe spongy cell, uh, you suture it in, in a figure of eight to, to the defect. Uh, but for, for the conservative option and this option, you have to, uh, review your patients in a week or so, just to make sure that uh, uh, the communication is not uh, uh, getting bigger or the patient is not experiencing uh, signs and symptoms associated with uh, an OEC. And then if it's five millimeters, and then we have uh, surgical options that we can treat the, 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 the perforation or the defect with. So going into those uh, surgical options, uh, we have uh, our local flaps where you can have the buccal advance, advancement flap, where you can also do a palatal flap, palatal rotation, or you can use uh, a buccal fed pad uh, to close the OEC. Originally, you would have your, your tongue flap and your temporalis muscle. But yeah, your temporalis muscle is actually used for defects that are bigger. So that will be more of your, uh, your, 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 your browns uh, classification types of defects, bigger defects. And you could use bone grafts. Uh, 
we could uh, also use uh, well the bone grafts you can get the bone from the ramus you can also get it from the synth area uh, or from the maxillary uh, tuberosity um, the allografts you can use uh, free green glue and your xenografts you can use bio ores or collagen and synthetic materials uh, materials like uh -huh. hydroxy appetite uh, so going into detail with your buccal advancement flap uh, which is uh, also known as a ramen flap it is the oldest, the most common, and um, I suppose the easiest to do. Um, it is used for small to moderately sized uh, OACs. It is a, a trapezoidal mucopristal flap with a white base, which the white base will give you good blood supply so that you don't have necrosis of your flap. And when doing it, you should always make sure that uh, it's 50% more than the, the defect. And it is also important to score the periosteum uh, on the vestibule so that you get uh, mobility of that flap and then you don't close it under tension. Uh, the, the disadvantage of this is to it shortens the the buccal the buccal advancement flap um, as per this diagram you can see first of all you would uh, try to uh, clean the, uh, the 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 communication. And actually, if there is a fistula, do a fistulectomy, remove uh, all that uh, epithelized tissue. Uh, the next thing that you do, you, you actually do your, 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 your releases, mesial and distal. Um, you go deep, score your peristium so that you can mobilize it. The other thing you can do, um, just to reduce the tension that's placed on that uh, flap, you can cut, uh, nibble a bit of bone so that you can uh, approximate the, 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 the buccal uh, flap more palatal. And then also release, the other thing that's useful is to release uh, your, your, your palatal mucosa so that you can nicely suture it and maybe advance it a bit to, to, to close the defect. And then you, you suture it. And after that, obviously, the patient will get post of instructions and, like, you know, soft diet, uh, no nose blowing, and then it will be reviewed in a week or two. So, for the buccal advancement flap, the buccal advancement flap, um, it's it's usually successful for closure of these OACs. For the palatal flap, it is used for defects larger than 10 millimeters. It can be used in conjunction with the buccal advancement flap. Um, it is contraindicated in patients with uh, palatoplasty or any palatal defects. Uh, they say this one, oh, the mucosa is actually thicker than the, the, the buccal mucosa. So it is more resistant than the buccal advancement flap. The other thing that we can use um, is the buccal fat pad, uh, which lies between the vaccinator and the masseter muscles. Um, it has uh, four extensions and a central body. Uh, so usually for closure of this uh, uh, oroental communications, we use the we use the buccal and the body. It is rich in blood supply. It is resistant to contraction, 
it is used for larger defects and then you can uh, use it in conjunction with the Iranian flare also. Uh, the tongue flare uh, is mostly used for defects on the heart palate. Uh, these defects have to be larger than 15 millimeters. Um, it, it, its advantage is that uh, it's from the tongue. We all know that the tongue has good blood supply. The only thing with it, you have to uh, sort of like put uh, the patient in, in terms of maxillary fixation just to protect your flap because the tongue always wants to move and if the patient is going to function, they might disturb the, the flap. And after about 14 to 21 days, you actually go in, remove the IMF, cut the base of, 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 of the pericle so that uh, you free the tongue. So with uh, regards to your post-operative uh, management, a patient should be always placed on analgesics, uh, antibiotics, um, just to prevent, uh, well, it, it depends on the duration of uh, uh, the, the communication. If there was some sort of uh, a, a sinus infection, you don't want to close the defect and just leave the infection in, in, in the sinus. Uh, you ask your patient to be on soft diet strictly to, so that you don't disturb uh, your, your flap and give it time to take. Uh, you put your patient on nasal uh, decongestants like uh, uh, nasal sprays and LRD so that they don't uh, blow their nose and then make uh, uh, the defect bigger. So what are, what are some of the complications that can arise from uh, uh, this uh, treatment of uh, OECs? You can get uh, the essence of the flap. You can get flap necrosis, especially if uh, the, 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 the flap is stretched too much and then that will obviously compromise the blood supply. You get infection, maybe you close it without treating uh, the infection that was already in the sinus and then that just tricks down. You get uh, trismus, you get depression in the cheek. This usually occurs when you do uh, your buccal fat, uh, pet uh, flap because now you, you're removing, removing that uh, fat on the cheek uh, and then just it creates a, a depression. Um, uh, another complication could be you, you would get a shallow vestibule uh, that um, happens after a, a buccal advancement flap. So that would be like uh, a thing that you can consider if you're planning to do uh, a denture for the patient. So if you plan to do a denture for, for, for a patient, you would rather use another option other than a buccal uh, advancement flap because that will certainly shorten your vestibule and then that will impact the retention of your, of your denture. Uh, these are some of the references uh, that I used for preparing this, uh, this talk. The, the first one is extremely useful. Uh, that one I would recommend that uh, we can try get all the information that you need um, for, 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 for management or uh, dealing with OAC is, in, is, is, is contained in there. Uh, thank you for your time, guys. Uh, just in summary, in, in conclusions, um, just a few points that I wanted to, to, to make uh, or maybe put a stamp on. Uh, we should always, always do x-rays prior to extraction. And then we can use the Hasegawa classification is extremely useful to, 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 to develop a high index of suspicion, uh, whether you're going to develop uh, an OEC or not. Obviously, we would be looking more at type two and type three and maybe type five. And then when you're evaluating whether you, 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 you have uh, an OEC, uh, the Valsalva test, 
ask the person to gently uh, do it because you don't want too much pressure and there was no OEC. Now, because of the Vasalva test, there is one. And one thing that uh, we, we don't do is uh, probing. Because actually with probing, you, you don't know that you perforating the, the floor. And with regards to uh, closure of this OACs, if you close it and the patient goes and then they come back and uh, it complicates, it, it's, it's still there. I think the best thing is to, to, to refer and quick uh, referral so that we, we, we stop uh, infections. And then if you're not sure, uh, I, I recommend that the buccal advancement flap, it's a pretty much easy one. That one, everyone can attempt. But if you're looking at something more complicated that the, like uh, maybe a tongue flap or, or even a palatal rotation flap, you can always refer to the closest max flap. And then it, it is also important to give uh, the patient uh, post-operative instructions, strict ones. I thank you. Um, Dr. Mavala, thank you for that. Um, I just want to make a few questions that have come in. Um, tell me the type of suture material that you'd use when uh, uh, doing these surgical procedures. What would you suggest? Chromic sutures, silk sutures, what would you suggest? Oh. I think any any suture material that slowly uh, resolves would actually work because you're looking at uh, uh, probably a week or so, and then the thing would uh, the OEC would 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 heal. Um, I wouldn't recommend it's intraoral. I wouldn't recommend something that needs to be removed. So chromic uh, would, would would I think would, would su suffice. Okay, and. Uh... Suturing techniques, uh, we, you know, when closing this uh, mattress sutures, interrupted sutures, uh, when trying to do, do the surgical, doing the buckle flaps? Uh, I, I think it's just personal preference. Uh, for me, I always trust uh, uh, your, 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 your interrupted. Because the other thing, you don't want to put your flap through too much tension. So if you, you're doing uh, interrupted, I think that, that would work. But uh, like I said, it just goes according to personal preference. The, the most important thing is to know that uh, you placed uh, your, your sutures in good tissue that will hold. Uh, I, I think whether you do my dress or it doesn't, it doesn't really affect the outcome. Okay, and just, just a little comment. Um, I found that, you know, with patients, those that, that, that are smokers are the ones that are most difficult to treat. They're the ones that keep coming back and you suture and you know what, it opens up again. And they open up. Patients that are uh, smokers I find it uh, much more challenging as opposed to patients that are non-smokers. Obviously, with uh, Dr. Khan, with uh, smoking, it, it it already compromises your 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 your, your blood supply to that to that flame. So uh, I I suppose, like I said, strict instructions to the patients. And if in doubt, are you thinking if I do a buccal advancement flare, it might fail because uh, he smokes? Then just escalate it to a max pack, and then. Uh, we can do it once and then we, we know it's, 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 it's done. But obviously they're, they're smoking um, um, uh, will affect uh, the, 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 the quality of blood supply to that flare, hence the higher failure rate in, the, in those individuals. Okay, um, just another question. Um, um, the types of antibiotics, uh, preferences, analgesics and decongestants it may be prescribed pre and post operatively. Um, we can always uh, use uh, Aladdin as a uh, nasal congestant. Um, 
in terms of your, your normal analgesics, because your, 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 your pineal proofing would, would, would work if the patient complains of too much uh, pain, um, we, 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 we can always go uh, to, to, to uh, medications like Tramal. But for your antibiotics, um, I would say probably uh, augmenting would, 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 would work well for you. Okay, and uh, okay, so and no, well, tell me, um, someone first, uh, no mention of PRF uh, to treat small to medium OACs, which is very successful in treating OACs without raising a flare. I don't know if Dr. Mvala knows about that PRF treatment to treat no, I'm small. Not, I'm, I'm not aware of it. You can just uh, tell me more about it. No, I, I, this is one of the questions that came in, Doc. Uh, oh, okay. I'm also not aware of it. I just thought maybe you do. It just says PRF to treat small to medium without raising a flap. I am not. I will look into okay. it. I will, I will have to look into it. Okay. Um, if a patient drinks water and it flows and passes through the nose, is it an acceptable method to diagnose an OAC? If a patient drinks water and then it passes... Yes, it's, it's, it's actually one of the symptoms that were listed in the presentation that uh, you get uh, uh, nasal regurgitation of your, your, your fluids that you, you drank orally. So okay. most of the patients will come in already complaining of that. Because um, I mean, uh, it's, it's not nice to be sitting in a restaurant and then you, you're drinking your, your nice juice and then it just comes out of your nose. <laughs> yes, yes, of course. <laughs> Of course. Um, uh, what is such a needle? The needle, uh, should it be round or cutting or does it make a difference? It's just uh, like, again, I've said with um, uh, preference of, of, of uh, the person who's doing the procedure. I, 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 I personally prefer non-cutting. Uh, I find it to be much better in my hands. But I cannot uh, say to another person, you cannot use uh, uh, cutting because I prefer the other. So it totally uh, depends on the individual doing the procedure. Um, what is the best method to clean the fistula? I mean, to, it, it, it also depends on, on uh, how long it has been there. Um, uh, um, a wash with uh, normal saline would be would be enough, but in terms of um, after that closing, uh, you have to make sure that you you remove the entire fistula before you close, because otherwise you you remove you you you, you can't close and then leave epithelialized tissue in 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 the in the tract. Um. And uh, so just explain the details. How would you treat a chronic sinusitis that is brought about by an old, old OAC? Is it, would it just be purely antibiotics or would it be surgically as well? Um, if it's chronic, uh, you can start uh, with antibiotics, but I would recommend that you, you, you refer it to a, an ENT specialist because they deal more with those and uh, it, it is easier because now if it's chronic, if it's chronic, uh, they already could be probably looking at um, uh, some surgery for it using the carrier look uh, approach. So, I mean, to put a patient in antibiotics and then it doesn't work, I, I, would, I, would, I would think maybe the, the, the correct approach would be, you can start them on um, antibiotics but uh, refer them to, to an ENT. Okay. Um, let me just see if there are any more questions. Um, okay, I think, Doc, I think we've covered most of the questions. All right, that's okay. Um, if there's anything else, uh, any members would like to ask any additional questions, you can just forward it through to 
Sada and Doc can reply to it and we will make sure that you get the answers through Sada as well. Um, if there aren't any more questions, then we will conclude this evening's presentation. Um, Dr. Mubala, thank you once again for the very informative uh, presentation. Um, we really appreciate you sacrificing your time with us tonight. And I would also like to just say a special thank you to Dr. Picasso from the Maxillofacial and Oral Surgery Department at the University of Bratislava for facilitating this meeting. Please tell him a big thank you from all of us. And uh, for everyone from SADA head office, uh, for the technical support that they've, 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 provided, they've, they've provided for the past this evening. And um, also to all SADA members, uh, hope, you, hope you enjoyed the presentation and it is beneficial to everyone attending. Um, once again, thank you. Good night and stay safe. Dr. Mubala. All the, all the best. Thank uh, you once again. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan. And to the colleagues, it, it was an absolute honor doing this uh, talk. Um, I hope it uh, uh, benefits um, all of us. And I apologize that you had to look at my face for about an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was a pleasure, Doctor. We, we really appreciate it. Okay. Uh, okay. You do well. Good night. All the best. Thank you. All the best. Wait, wait.